Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm delighted to be here with former Prime Minister John Howard to talk about his new book, Menzies Era. Welcome, Mr Howard. Thank you. Good to be here. I want to make note of the fact that it's called The Menzies Era rather than just a straight biography of Menzies. Why have you chosen to do that? Because there has been a, a very good biography written of Menzies and I wanted, as well as focusing obviously on him, because he was the dominant personality of the era, I also wanted to deal with the, the principal issues of that period in Australian politics from 1949 to 1972. It was 23 years of Liberal Country Party government. It started with Menzies' election in 1949 and it ended with Gough Whitlam leading the Labor Party back into government after so long in opposition. Uh, but it's an era dominated by Menzies because um, uh, he um, was Prime Minister for 16 years and he um, bestrode the political scene like the Shakespearean colossus, uh, like no other figure has done of any other era in Australian political history. You've long been associated, um, your, your um, admiration for Menzies has long been known. Um, were you was this an attempt to explain why you had such a great interest in Menzies through that, that period? Because there was association with Howard wants to bring back the 50s and there was that sort of complaint. Are you, are you explaining why that, that you have, a, have, a, have an interest and, and were, uh, had an admiration for that period? In the course of the book, um, I explain why Menzies was so successful, but the purpose was not to explain my admiration for him. Uh, I admired and respected his achievements, but I was particularly interested in analysing a period which he dominated and which in turn really shaped modern Australia. Because if you look at modern Australia, you think of um, the strong economy, uh, his successful uh, defeat of the attempt to socialise the banks in the late 1940s, uh, if that attempt had succeeded, uh, the Australian economy would have been very different. Uh, the engagement with Asia. People forget that it was in Menzies' time that we had the Colombo Plan that introduced Asian students to Australian universities and also the trade agreement with Japan in 1957. That was of enormous historic significance. It was only 12 years after World War II. It was bitterly opposed uh, by the Labor Party and by many in the community but it was far-sighted. Now, that was driven by Menzies and his deputy, John McEwen, who emerged very clearly as the second most powerful figure of that whole era. And uh, you also look at the continuation of the successful migration program and uh, uh, the opening up of higher education through the reforms of Menzies in the late 1950s to many more Australian students, the breakdown of, of some of the sectarian divide when Menzies decided to give direct government assistance to independent, and that was largely Catholic schools. These developments have had a lasting impact and they have flowed through to the modern Australia now. I acknowledge that the nation has changed enormously, but you can still see connecting threads. In the, uh, in the I think 1941, um, Menzies resigned as Prime Minister. Um, up until then, in the way you describe it, he hadn't had many failures or, or had to face those kinds of troubles in his, in his life. He'd done so well in school, in his law career. Um, this moment, is, is that a kind of defining moment for him? Is this the moment where he, he stepped back and, and found what was, what was his purpose? Because he seemed to have come back after this with, with a, a great deal of purpose and people f flocked to him. They, 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 they followed him into the next election and they, they, he, he became Prime Minister and then went on for, for, for so long. Is that failure important? You put your finger on a, a, a crucial, pivotal, however you describe it, moment in his history, in his career. Up until then, he'd had an almost effortless rise to the top. He'd had his critics, but he was very bright. Uh, he was very eloquent. Uh, he probably didn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, and by, what was it, August of 1941, he'd been Prime Minister for uh, a short period of time. He'd come in in 1939 
he lost the confidence of his colleagues and it would have been devastating, but he was sufficient of uh, a man to realise that it had partly come about because of his own behaviour. And uh, he understood that and uh, he then set about reviving himself and his greatest single achievement in those years, of course, was to create the Liberal Party uh, because the anti-Labour forces in 1943 were decimated uh, when John Curtin won a sweeping victory for the Labour Party and it was obvious that the centre-right of politics in our country needed a new voice and Menzies set about forming it, but unlike its predecessors, uh, it was a, formed around a positive espousal of values and attitudes rather than just being a uh, a cobbled together political alliance between anti-Labour people and disgruntled Labour people. That point is important because I, you, you refer to his, um, his weekly broadcasts um, on the TUE and, and the, one of the parts is the, the forgotten people. Um, and I just want to read out, because this, this, to me this is, there, there are parallels in my mind as I'm reading this to your career as Prime Minister as well. And when I read this, this paragraph that you've quoted here, um, I, I, I felt that there was a, a very a great similarity to, to the view. So um, this, is, um, this is Menzies. I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found either in the great luxury hotels or the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs or in the officialdom of organised masses. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and unadvertised. The home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is the indispensable condition of continuity its health determines the health of society as a whole. To me, that is echoed in your Prime Ministership. Well, I'm, I would plead guilty to that. I thought they were great words. I, I didn't consciously set out to emulate that, but I certainly uh, agree with everything that he said in that. And is that the kernel of the, of the Liberal Party? Uh, well, 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 yes, in, in many ways it is. And the appeal in that speech was an appeal that crossed uh, every demographic in the country. In the, a successful political party obviously has a base, but it's got to be sufficiently appealing to people who don't naturally belong to that base uh, to uh, attract their support. And uh, the idea implicit in what he said in those words that the most important thing that we do in a sense is to rear the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, the appeal of that transcends differences of background, of whether your father came from Italy or what. Ireland or, or whether you're a trade unionist or whether you're in a small business, it doesn't matter. Everybody in the main is, is interested in doing the right thing by their family and if they have children uh, rearing them to be good citizens and, and have a good opportunity in life and uh, Menzies understood that. You don't shy away from pointing out his, his faults in, in the book. Um, the, the, he misjudged um, uh, the, the Hitler uh, in, in Europe, he was on the appeasement side of things. Um, what are what are some of the if you were if you were to pull him aside and say look Bob Bob <laughs> yes. look yeah. this is something you should you should correct or what are what are some of the faults oh, well, he, he, along with everybody else with the exception of Winston Churchill uh, just about um, he, he he did have a, a pro appeasement attitude but everybody did John Curtin did Neville Chamberlain did uh, the Americans did well, they weren't even involved uh, so everybody. Uh, had that or tended to have that view, and, but uh, in later years he uh, mishandled, when you look at it, the Communist Party referendum. He might well have been successful in that if he had presented a less complicated proposition. Right. Because what happened was that a bill was passed and it was supported by the Labor Party in the end, but it was declared unconstitutional by the High Court and he had the referendum to uh, all of the constitution so as to make it constitutional, which is the traditional thing you do if you if you want to proceed with something declared unconstitutional. But instead of just saying to the Australian people, well, do you agree uh, that that act should be permissible, uh, he added a whole lot of other things and that enabled his opponents uh, to discredit and to allege that he was going too far. And uh, that was, that campaign was <coughs> Dr. Everts, uh, greatest triumph because he won that. He started a long way behind and he and he won it. So that was clearly 
uh, a miscalculation. He clearly miscalculated his management of the economy uh, in 1960 and 1961, and he um, almost lost that election. He went within a whisker of losing that election. But um, like everybody in politics, um, you, you make mistakes. Uh, there's not been a political leader born who hasn't made a lot of mistakes, myself included. And what can, what can um, the Menzies era teach um, modern politicians? Is there anything that they should be learning? They should understand <clears throat> the importance of, of having clear attitudes and clear convictions. Menzies was a conviction politician. That expression wasn't used in, uh, in, the, in the 1950s and 60s. But it wasn't needed? Well, it wasn't needed? No, no, no. Well, well it, was, it was a more ideological age. The divide between right and left was sharper and, and it was felt to be sharper. People more um, energetically identified with the different sides of politics. That doesn't happen to the same extent now. I argue in the book that in those days there was a 40-40-20 rule and 40% voted Labor, 40% voted Liberal and 20% moved around. I sometimes think now we're operating in a 30-30-40 yeah. environment. And yeah, I got that feeling too. Yeah, it, it, it's just... <clears throat> and part of that is due to the, uh, the, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of Soviet imperialism and the idea that there were two competing economic models, the command economy model uh, of Eastern Europe and the, and the Western capitalist one. And the whole economic debate has moved a little bit to the right, uh, to coin a phrase. So it's, it's a different playing field, but the need to have strong convictions and to argue them effectively. Menzies had strong views. He was a, he was a consummate presenter. He could argue, he was a very aggressive political campaigner, but once he got there, uh, he did understand the need to govern in an orderly way. I think it's still true today that, that, that people want the government around when it's needed, but when it's not needed, they don't mind taking a break from it. Yes, uh, we don't get a break from government. No, no, it's a lot harder now because of, of the media, uh, but uh, I, I felt when I was Prime Minister, sometimes the best thing I could do was just not be visible for a few days. If there was nothing to say, uh, why be visible? And just let people get on with their lives. Thank you very much, um, Mr Howard. Thank you, and I have plenty of your um, uh, customers find it enjoyable to read because it is. John Howard's The Menzies Era is available from booktopia.com.au right now.